Peace, loved ones. Hope everybody is well out there in the cosmos. It's been an interesting month since we dropped the last podcast. Um, First, just a political piece. Everybody is freaking out because Donald Trump is the president-elect. And it feels like we're in some strange twilight zone. Like we're in a dream like lucid dreaming, like part of us knows this is all just a dream, but other part of us is going along with it, and uh, I don't know what to make of it, just like everybody else, but if any time we need to amplify the love and the light and uh, the blessings, now is the time, so Of course, that's what we're trying to do with this podcast, and uh, I hope y'all feel it. This podcast that you are about to listen to is a podcast episode with two guests. I think it's the first time we've had two guests at once, and the guests are Michael Sujic and Peter Sanders. Um, These two individuals are two of our elders and and teachers on the path, people who Peter Sanders I've met on multiple occasions, but uh, Michael, it was the first time meeting him, but I had read his book entitled Signs on the Horizon, and the book is about his meetings with various saints and sages and Sufi masters. And he's someone who has had the ability to travel all over the world over the last four or five decades and meet many of the greatest uh, sages and saints of the 20th century and 21st century. And many of these people have already passed on, in fact. And so the book is beautiful in that it just tells the story. It tells the stories of his meetings with these individuals. And Peter Sanders is a great photographer. He was a big rock and roll photographer back in the day, um, photographing everyone from Jimi Hendrix to the Beatles, you name it. And he was someone who also had a spiritual transformation and took the path of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And both of these individuals were part of a community uh, of students of Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib, who was one of the greatest Sufi saints and uh, Islamic scholars of North Africa in the 20th century. And they, their group was led by an individual named Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Sufi. And it was a very prolific and uh, amazingly interesting community. Uh, they squatted in an abandoned building in London, and they all lived together, and they would do dhikr all the time, and they were living a kind of uh, Islamic, Sufi, very Moroccan, Maliki lifestyle in London. And one of them told me a story that at the time, they all none of them had jobs, really. They were all just doing dhikr day and night, and remembrance, and Abdul Qadir told them, he said, okay, who wants to stay here and do dhikr? And half of them raised their hand. And then he said, and who wants to go out and work uh, so we can feed the community? And half of them raised their hand. And he said, okay, the ones who want to work, you stay and do dhikr, and the ones that want to do dhikr, you go out and find some work. But they used to, you know, kind of like do processions marching through the streets of London in like turbans and Moroccan garb and stuff like that and make their own clothes. And this was like the late sixties and the seventies. So many of them came out of the the counterculture sixties and seventies hippies and, and things of that nature. So, uh, one of my poetic inspirations, Abdul Haimur, uh, whom my recent book of poetry is, uh, 
is dedicated to. He was in that community, uh, and many people who would go on to be hugely influential scholars um, in the West, including uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, um, and people like uh, even Muhammad Sharif, for those that know the you know he was in the Bay Area quite active, you know Qadri within, uh, within the African American. Uh, Jamaat of the Shehu was also part of that, I understand, and many, many more people. So it's one of those things that I've sat with many of the people that were in that community and many people that still are, actually. It still survives in, in a kind of different manifestation to this day, but they have communities all over the world, including in Norwich in the United Kingdom and South Africa and uh, Granada, actually. They have a beautiful mosque in Granada that I visited but it's a really important chapter of the history of uh, Islam in the West. And anyway, Peter Sanders, uh, he used his photography uh, mastery to photograph many of the great saints and sages of the 20th and 21st century. So in their own way, both of these individuals, uh, Michael Sujik as an author and Peter Sanders as a photographer, they kind of dedicated themselves over the past few decades to preserving and transmitting and reflecting on the transformative meetings that they had with enlightened masters. And so in this uh, podcast episode, which is shorter than most, and uh, it actually happened over tea, high tea, right? Very British at Peter Sanders' house. Uh, so excuse a little if you hear the the, the, the tea set clinking. Um, and also, I didn't have my normal mic because I was on the road. So uh, the sound quality isn't as good as it usually is. But anyway, I think there's some something of great beauty that came through. So I wanted to share it. But anyway, um, they both are using their their artistic gifts to share the realities and their reflections on what it means to be uh, transformed, what it means to be drawn near to the divine, what it means to be a wali, what it means to be enlightened. And they have sat with many of the real deal, the real deal saints and sages um, of our era and of the previous era, because as I mentioned before, many of them have passed on. In fact, Peter Sanders mentioned that most people in his book, this book, Meetings with Mountains, which he uh, should be releasing soon, most of the people in the book have actually passed on. So I hope you enjoy this uh, podcast. I'm going to let you have it. Sorry for the, the longer intro, but the podcast itself is shorter than usual because I just had a brief meeting with them before I had to go to a performance at Rumi's Cave in London. Shout out to Rumi's Cave. Um, so yeah, I'm just coming off a beautiful uh, two weeks in the UK and then a week in mainland Europe. I went to Germany as well as uh, Amsterdam and The Hague. Beautiful, beautiful things going on. And everyone there is freaking out because I was over there when Trump got elected and everyone out there is really concerned um, about what this means for the, the world. In fact, the cover of the newspaper in Berlin after he got elected the day I was there said it said oh my god in english and then in german there was a phrase i said what does this mean and they said it means roughly what will become of the world and it was a picture of the statue of liberty lady liberty cowering and like hiding under a tattered american flag it was a really powerful image i almost forgot before i go I wanted to thank everybody that has supported the podcast on Patreon. Um, last month, we started a Patreon page for Path and Present Podcast. Patreon is a way that you can support uh, monthly. And a couple of people, actually five or six people um, out there gave money. A couple of people gave like 100 bucks a month. So peace and thank you to you. You know who you are. And 
If you have the ability to sponsor or to support the podcast, it's greatly appreciated. We don't have any advertisements, no corporate sponsors. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we get a lot of love for the podcast, and a lot of people have said it's really transformative for them. Uh, there was a sister in London that came up to me at an event I did and said, thank you so much for your podcast that you did with Dustin Cron because it changed my life and it actually uh, made me decide what I wanted to study in university. And now I'm doing a, uh, a, a research project for my graduation paper around one of the topics that you discussed. So alhamdulillah, we, we are grateful for that. And we're just trying to showcase some of the beauty and the love and the light that's out there. But I'd like to do it more and like to be able to devote more time to it. And um, so if you can support, the link for the Patreon is on our SoundCloud page. Uh, without further ado, path and present in one love. It's an honor to be with you guys. And I love, um, I love hearing all the old stories of back in the day and you know, sitting with... Uh, Abdul Hai Moore and Hakeem Archuleta and Abdul Bari McCabe and those that I've had the blessing of sitting with over the years and, you know, just hearing all the old hippie days and the kind of being a seeker and the Floating Lotus Opera House and the commune, communal living in Berkeley and the acid trips and all that. And then, you know, uh, Abdul Qadir coming and then picking him up in the what is it? The grass car with toadstool seats. Just all the like crazy stories. And then, of course, living together in London and Spain. And, you know, I feel like in many ways I inherit a lot of that because so much changed in the 60s and 70s. Counterculture, anti-war, turning east for spirituality. And now, you know, I've been born in the 80s into a world where yoga on every corner and transcendental meditation and the you know, metaphysical bookstore where they have Sufi books and Buddhist books and Taoism and all that. And so that was kind of the world that I come into. And then out of that whole sphere being drawn to Islam. And so seeing your generation, those that kind of come through similar, right, artists and seekers and take the path in the 70s or 60s or, you know, I see like you guys are kind of like my, the uncles that I never had, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, you, so I love hearing the stories. And when we were sitting yesterday at lunch, what's beautiful about both of you is that as a writer and an author, and then you, Peter, as a photographer, your recent projects are basically very similar in that you are using your art to share with the world, the stories, the experiences that you had with, some of the great saints and sages that you were blessed to meet along your journey. And I was just reflecting the vast majority of the people that you photographed and that you mentioned are no longer even in this world. Mm. And so I guess I just wanted to open it up there because I loved reading your book and I love well, obviously looking at your pictures and just seeing like that people like this exist. And most people don't know, like the idea of, and I, I've actually talked to a lot of people. If you live in a traditional society, you know where the, the enlightened master is, right? He's in, in the mountain or he's in the village. or he's just, And you go visit him for a blessing or prayer, even if you're mostly focusing on the world or keeping a shop or keeping a family. But, you know, traditional societies, they knew where the, the saint, the holy people were. And you knew where to go if you wanted to take that path and where it led. You saw kind of the fruit of the tree of the spiritual path. But I think most people in the modern world don't really even have that idea that it leads to anything. You know, it seems to be lost that they're, that, you know, or maybe it's a vague idea that somehow in the past there were holy people, but the idea that there's living, enlightened, saintly sages breathing the same air as us seems to be something lost to a lot of modern people. So, Particularly in the world of Islam. Particularly in the world, so. when I when I do workshops, I I say to them, if, you know, uh, if I said to you, you know, have you heard of extremists within Islam? Every one of them will say yes, but I say, have you heard of the opposite? And no one has 
because it's been kept very silent. And they're, they're there, within, with, the same within every religion. You know, these people exist. They're just not heard of within the world of Islam, but they definitely exist. Mm-hmm. And, and what's happened <clears throat> in the last, say, 30 or 40 years is that the, the um, dominant religious discourse is informed by what people call the Salafi idea, the reformist idea, or the Wahhabi I, I, idea about Islam, <clears throat> which denies um, the spirituality of Islam. It's, in, in other words, people are taught that God is up there, we're down here, and there's no connection except that we have to behave ourselves mm be good Muslims, and then we go to heaven if God, if we're lucky, or if, we, if God, you know, blesses us, and if we behave correctly. And there's a lot more than that. Islam is a much deeper and richer uh, spiritual path. And so the, what's happened is that the deen al Hassan uh, has been removed from the mainstream of Islam. And this is a, tra- this is the, a tragedy and we're seeing the results of this in these extremist movements. Um, people don't, and they're not, and they honestly don't know that they, that the that these paths exist. So, if you talk about, for example, Sufism, <clears throat> Sufism has a bad name, and it's because, as uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf s- said recently, it's it's been ossified. You know, the traditional Sufi orders became, uh, you know, kind of ceremonial and, and uh, hidebound and uh, they, they lost the inner spirituality or they lost some of that. And uh, so the reformists picked up on that and they've discredited Tasawuf, but Tasawuf is a science of, purify, of purifying the heart. Um, and, and, and without this Deen ad Hassan, and Ihsan, of course, means to worship Allah as if you, if you see him. For while you do not see him, surely he sees you. This idea of having a powerful, overpowering sense of the presence of Allah is missing in the lives of most people. And if they don't have that, if they don't have this taste of Iman, of the unseen, um, it's very easy for, for people to fall away from this, this beautiful religion. Um, and, you know, go toward the world on the one hand, or head toward a m- much more extreme, intense form of Islam, which is really violent, but, you know, creates adrenaline and, and it, it can be very addictive for people because they, they, they want to have a taste of something. And without the Deen al Hassan, you know, you it's 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 deprived from you. you. People become mechanistic. They go go to the they do their five prayers. They do the minimum and maybe some more, but they don't. They, it's it's not going anywhere because they're in on a flat plane waiting to die. And God, uh, you know, God is up there in heaven. And there's and, and nothing will happen in the world other than you behaving oneself. Right. It's not seen necessarily as a path that's leading you somewhere. Yeah. It's just something you do and that's it. Yeah. And I've seen that like, you know, you see with converts to Islam, people are always like, oh my God, you converted to Islam, you're so much better, you take it so much seriously. Because for a lot of Muslims, it seems like Islam is just something that you're, you are. It's You're born into it and that's it. There's not necessarily, that it's not necessarily taught that this is actually a path of transformation this is like an alchemy yeah. that if you actually put this and this and this together mm-hmm. you know and i even i did a performance in singapore a few years ago and and i was just talking about the spiritual path in between my pieces and stuff like that and afterwards one of the you know uh, singaporean muslim women came up to me and she said i loved your performance but i had, i'm a bit confused i have a question is there such thing as spirituality in Islam? <laughs> extraordinary. That's that's extraordinary. But that's you you. That's I think the 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 
the unspoken reality of most Muslims is that they have no idea that there's a spiritual dimension to Islam anymore. It's very tragic. And so, one, one of someone once said to me, they said, in Islam there's an ideal of ideal normalcy. In the way that the awliya, the saints, they're, the, in a sense, you could say the normal, the healthy, the whole people, right? Ihsan al kamil this idea. And that, you know, we're all striving to heal ourselves to get to that point, right? We don't say... It's not a lowest common denominator thing where we're just animals or whatever. No, but there's Benny Adam is actually a, a very noble thing, the children of Adam. And to actualize your full potential as a human being, that is what the saints and sages do. So you, both of you, all three of you, you had the ability to uh, encounter some incredible men and women of Allah. Um, those who, you know, starting with Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib and, and those around him, right, mm-hmm. being one of the great sages of the 20th century in, in North Africa. So, but then on down the line, I mean, reading your book, you've, <laughs> mashallah, had, an, had the ability to meet some of the, the greatest hits mm-hmm. of the 20th century. And same with you, um, Peter, through your photography. So... I guess what I would ask is, what qualities did these did those people have that, you know, what, if you were to say, what thread weaves them all together? What do you find? I mean, they all have their unique personalities, sure, but what qualities do they have that stuck out to you? I would say that the, the, the common quality of all the Audi is that they, they've, they've conquered the ego, they, 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 their nafs um, is is not just under control. It, it it's it's gone. In, in in in, I mean, they're still people. They still have human attributes, but the the thing that they that we consider as ourselves is absent from these people. And that absence creates a presence. Uh, and Sheikh Darqawi said, "When the heart is." emptied of beings it becomes filled with being and so when you're with these people they 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 don't they they have no skin in the game if you if you know they have a kind of a detachment but that's a beautiful detachment that's based upon on living for other people being you know caring for other people they you don't see them get angry for example you don't see them get jealous you don't see them get, they they don't have these things anymore, and it kind of dawns on you. It isn't you know it isn't that they're at, you know they have a, a flag saying I have no ego. They just don't have it. And you 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 when you come away from these people, you realize that they don't they, they they're not there. And this is the 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 absolute um, uh, polar opposite of of um, modern life, which. The, the the whole point of modern life and 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 the modern world is to glorify and develop the ego to become more amazing more famous more powerful more rich more everything more excellent what all of these things that people strive for is the opposite of what these aulia have done which is to dismantle the the, the ego and to overcome it, and you do this by countering it, and you do it, and this is the the, the common thread is dhikrullah, is remembering God. Uh, my Sheikh Muli Hashim uh, Balghiti, he said to me, he said to me, do whatever you like, but you will regret every hour you don't remember Allah. This is this is the common thread amongst all of these men of God. And in fact, it's the common thread amongst all men of God in every confession, in, in one form or another. They may they may not call what they do dhikr Allah. They may they may have another word for it. But it's basically to contemplate and to remember the presence of the absolute. Mm. And you, in order to do that, you have to forget yourself. 
And that's the hard part, is getting rid of the self. But these are people who have dedicated their entire existence to the remembrance of Allah. And in the end of the day, through the, 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 the gift and, and, and mercy of God, they have succeeded and had an opening that has shown them basically that they don't really exist, that this ego and you can own, and, the, and part of the problem in, in nowadays is that people think that they have no access to this at all, that this is some mythical, spiritual um, uh, experience that is only special people can have. But that's not true. If it were, if it were, if it were untrue, then we wouldn't even know about these things. But we do know about them, and it, it's. That, that you have access because you have enoughs. Enoughs is the locus of, I mean, this, so the, 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 the prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu, the, the one who knows the self knows his Lord. And that it's only through the self that you can have these experiences. You cannot have an experience through another self or through another vehicle. This is all we have. We have our perceptions and our experience, and it's that the purification of the heart and the purification of the soul that um, allows us to to have a, a transcendent experience in, in the world. I think I would add that they're, the, they're very unjudgmental. That's the thing that I really, they never judge you, no matter wh- who you are or where you are in your journey. They just see you at a certain point and they make prayers for you to help you. On, and that's, that, that, that was very uh, significant to all of them, I think. They're highly evolved beings, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, most of them don't say very much. <laughs> it's, you sit in their company and you just, you just you just get something, you know. It's it's, it's it's something beyond words, really. I mean, and they're very beautiful people, extraordinary. You know, and many of them are hidden away. Sure. Abul Abbas al Morsi said that it's harder to meet a friend of God or a saint than it is, to, or it's harder to find a friend of God or saint than it is to find God, because we know God through His perfection. And he said, how can we find, know someone or find someone who eats as we eat mm-hmm. and sleeps as we sleep? You know, I mean, it's because they're human as well. Mm-hmm. They're, they're human, but they have this kind of ineffable quality about them that uh, Peter was talking about. They, they are human beings in the true yeah. sense, human beings. You know, I mean, they're just present and... Uh, that's what you get from them. If you if you notice today, mo- the majority of people are very distracted in a state of distraction, even more so now. You know, I mean, this this repose of people bent over their phone is just the norm now. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna have this posture where they're kind of, you know, I went to a park and and I, it was a picture I saw it and a glimpse of a moment I didn't have a chance to get it. But there were like seven to ten people coming to them and they were all engrossed in their phone and they were not aware of what was happening around them it, it's kind of a bit strange really it's and it's it's kind of this, this is the world we're kind of in and in that world you're missing so much because it's all by being present mm-hmm. you know everything is by the more present you are the more you'll experience the miracles of life mm-hmm. and people are in danger of missing it all because every moment is new this moment will never never be again each one is fresh that's beautiful. And I, what you said, there's a type of absence of the that lower, distracted, almost like that animal self just pulling you in every which way, yeah. and me, 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 and self-preservation. Yeah. And because of the absence, then there can be a, a greater presence. Yeah. And what you mentioned is that it's not so much necessarily what they say, it's just being in their presence Absolutely, yeah. that actually transforms you. Yeah. And that's one fascinating thing that, you know, all these traditional uh, contemplative spiritual paths have in common is that 
you know, it doesn't come from books. It's not, it's actually sitting with someone who sat with someone. It's this idea of transmission. That yes. There is something ineffable that is transferred when you spend time in, in the mm. present. Yeah. Uh, one of the awliya had a, a, a dream of the Prophet Muhammad, mm-hmm. and he asked the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me what the best thing to do in this world is. And the Prophet والسلام, said, to sit with a friend of God for as long as it takes to milk a goat or boil an egg. It's an amazing, amazing piece of advice. But there's so much truth to that, to that, that, that you benefit so much from being with someone who's an exemplar, who, who, who doesn't get angry, who doesn't, you know, um, it's not that they're, per, you know, that they're human. Mm-hmm. Um, Sahal ibn Abdullah al-Tustari uh, was incontinent. You know, he, 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 mm-hmm. he, he, he but Allah l- allowed him not to be incontinent when he was on the minbar mm-hmm. giving khutbah. Mm-hmm. It was like a karama for him. But, it, you know, he, he, he was human. He had, and peop- and you see these people, I mean, one of the, the awliya that I spent time with, his wife was insane. I mean, she was, she was mad. And I met her and she was very sweet, but, you know, really disturbed. The, he's human. He has, you know, the, the, they eat, they sleep, they have children. Children can have, the, have problems. They have financial problems. You know, it's not that they're out of the world or they're, you know, floating on some sort of, you know, flying carpet, except maybe inwardly. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they, they they have something incredibly beautiful, and inc- that, that that the people who sit with them they affect you, mm-hmm. and they also give you a discrimination because then you can tell the difference between someone who's real and someone who's um, not real. I mean, there are people who are pretending to be something that they're not. But you can, it's, it's just, you, you get a sense of who these people are. Mm. And it's very common. Uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said to me some, once, which I, I, something I thought was a great insight. He, he said, the experiences of the saints in Indonesia is, are exactly the same as the experiences of the saints in Morocco or Mali or anywhere in the world. He said, is this not a science? It's not, it's not like so, it's some sort of imaginal thing, you know, mm-hmm. where people make up something. No, they're exactly, they, they describe exactly the same realities in different languages and different cultures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so we're, you know, the, the sciences of the, the Deen al-Ihsan are sciences that will take you to a much deeper spirituality. Mm. Yeah, the Buddhists have a saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> and I think, you know, they even say that the some of the people most veiled from the awliya are those closest to them because you can be veiled by their humanity. You see, oh, that person eats and drinks. What? I, yeah. I was expecting someone who, like you say, on a floating yeah. magic carpet. Yeah. So they do the same thing. They chop wood, carry water. But is it that, like, what are those qualities? Is it just that they have a, a certain level, like you mentioned, a detachment? Is it just a more perfect tawakkul? Like, a, like they, have, they don't rely on themselves or outward forms, they rely on themselves. Or is it that they see in the multiplicity, they see really things as ayatullah, that there's one mover behind this all? Mm. Yeah. And then, you know, mindfulness is a very fashionable word these mm-hmm. days. But they have whatever mindfulness is, they have it. You know, every second there's an awareness. And, uh, yeah. Uh, one of, one of uh, my, my teachers, Sayyid Omar Abdullah, uh, radiallahu anhu, he, uh, he said that the, that the people of the path are abid al-waqt, they're the slaves of the second of mm-hmm. the moment. And that's, they strive to be in remembrance at all times with every breath, with every glance. And it's, it's that, that, that um, 
effort that they put into focusing their hearts on, on remembering God uh, that creates the, the, this, the, this great sort of knowledge and benefit. And people, it, it seems too simple. You know, it, it's like it can't be that simple, but it is. It's very simple, it's very easy, but it's very challenging because we've got a self which is standing in the way of that. And that self creates illusions, you know, the illusion of, of, of the, I'm, I'm happy and great, or I'm unhappy and miserable and awful. All that, it, it's all an illusion. So it's the, 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 the thread of remembrance of God that the, 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 the heart is subsumed into that. Uh, into that um, mindfulness state, uh, because that's what mm-hmm. we're talking about, is this sense that God is, is present. I have something that I picked up at the Salisbury Cathedral. It's a little plaque, which apparently was uh, you know, on the, uh, above the door of, of Carl Jung's house. Mm-hmm. It says, bidden or not bidden, God is present. That's a beautiful saying, and it's it's. This is what we have to remind ourselves: whether we're calling on Allah, on God, or not calling on God, He's present at all times. And and the 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 saints of Islam uh, are aware of this. They're they're mindful of, of this reality. I, w- I was told uh, that there was a um, a scholar in. Other Mahmoud, who was giving a class, and he said, I want you all to put your pens down and listen. And then he said, um, Paradise is guaranteed to the person whose last words are, There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. And he died immediately after that point. So he had the presence of mind to know that he was dying, and he taught right to the last minute. Allah. And died in front of him. Allah. That's it. That's that's mindfulness. Mm. That's when you need it. Mm. Yeah, mm. <laughs> that's when it counts. <laughs> so you, okay. you know, I personally love hearing the stories of the the, the good old days from you guys, um, those sixties and seventies. And for those that don't know, um, you were part of a really amazing community and a really amazing group of people and. People now that have gone on to be some of the most influential scholars and I mean, even artists and writers and photographers um, in the world. But when you hear, when I see you guys talk about that time, it's just like a time of such profound potency and like almost infinite potential. So I was just hoping maybe you could share for those that don't know anything about that, like what was it like to be in that community? And what, what was it that you were a part of? And how did it come about for you? I mean, it's, it's quite interesting that you say that because I've done a lot of reflection on what I was doing because I was documenting all these musicians. I was documenting that, you know, the late 60s. And it, it can be dismissed as a kind of drug, hippie kind of peace and love movement. But if you actually dig deeper into it, as you mentioned, there were a lot of things that started in that period, the, and you know, the anti-war peace movement, the roots of ecology, you know, health, food, enlightenment, looking for other paths and things. And I think that's quite the significant, you know, we know about the musicians, but there was a subculture which surrounded all of that, and we were, we were looking at that as a project. But um, I think that we grew out of that. So, I mean, I think that there was some awakening happening within ourselves and generally at that time. And I guess like many people, we were looking for something different and it just happened that we, our path took us to Islam. I wasn't particularly looking for religion, but uh, I was looking for answers, you know. Why did I always feel so anxious? You know, I wanted to feel calm. You know, all these things. I knew what the ideals were. Right? I didn't. I wasn't experiencing it. So I think we were all part of that. Mm. And I guess somehow God brought us all together. And that's so we were sharing. I think common. Mm. And it was made easy for us. People forget there was no, there was no extremism. There was no, um, there was no extremism. You know, it's not. 
the Islam of today was not, you know, not existing then. It was a kind of, it was a new, it was not, not people knew very little about it. So. so for those that don't know about the community, maybe you could talk about what it was and what was going on. Uh, well, we, we got to, we, um, we, there were a number of us, I, I would say, 50 or, or so people who were gathered together ar- around the teachings of, uh, of a great uh, saint, a great sheikh, uh, Muhammad ibn Habib. And um, uh, there was an established practice um, of dhikr Allah, which was very powerful. And this was this was reinforced by visits to the, uh, his, his community or his uh, community of followers in Morocco. And it was very authentic. And it was the first time probably most of us had ever met Aulia. Uh, you know, and, we, and they were, at that point, they were recognizable. When I went to meet Sheikh Mohammed Nabib and we were taken to his room, he said to me one thing that has always stayed with me and there's such wisdom. He said, now you have two teachers, Sidna Isa, Jesus and Muhammad. So he didn't separate what I came from, he joined them together. Mm-hmm. And there's such wisdom, you know, that's huge wisdom in that. Area. Right. It's not turning your back on what you were brought up with. Yeah. It's just... This adding, is, putting the capstone on it. Or, yeah, you know. yeah. yeah no, I think a lot of people, when they look back at that period, they tend to relate it to some sort of hippie thing, which it wasn't at all, even though most of the people that joined had something to do with that, that era. Um, it was about dhikr Allah. Mm. And everybody that I know, all of us, gathered for that reason uh, and that reason only mm. it was it was for remembrance of god and by being able to sit with uh, some of the aulia uh, uh, of that time uh, this that that's the only thing they were interested in i, I remember in and the first year that i went to morocco i i, I went gray in within uh, within about 3 weeks I started going gray. Someone said, oh, my God, you're, 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 your hair is gray. And it was because they didn't care about anything, anything except remembering Allah. And I was still thinking about myself and, you know, about, you know, my, 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 my feelings and my emotions and you know, my insecurities and all of that. And these people had, had, had left all of that. And that made a huge impact on, on, on all of us. Um, in different ways, and seeing these people who, who honestly um, had transcended uh, ordinary life, they, they, they were attached to, to, the, to the divine, and really, you know, like, it's like going, you know, they were, they were almost fanatical about it. Love, you know, when, whenever there was a, a vicar that was, that was being organized, they'd you know, get really excited, and are you coming to the thicker? You know, it was something that they loved. And you still see this today, which is a wonderful thing in traditional societies. It's a very beautiful uh, experience. So that that was really the core, and what we all we did was try to, you know, sort of um, transport that experience into a Western uh, environment. And we were able to do that for a number of years, and then things changed. But by that time, those of us who really kind of been imprinted by this um, went on and, and met other people and sought out other people like uh, the Ba'alawi Shuyukh of the time and, and other, other great uh, men of God. And uh, so it was, it was really the dhikr. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. It wasn't a lifestyle issue. It really wasn't. Um, you know, we had a lifestyle, but it was really revolving around the remembrance of Allah. And try- And I think that one of the <clears throat> weaknesses of that particular experience was the lack of formal knowledge. I don't think there was enough of that. And um, a lot of us had to sort of p- try to play catch up after the fact. Um, mm-hmm. 
and and go on. And then you had people like uh, Sheikh Hamza who came out of that at, toward, toward in a later period or toward the end of that period and uh, went on and, and, and studied uh, and, and learned Arabic and really uh, uh, went f- much further. Mm-hmm. But when I, when I, in addition to that, when I talk to people that live through it, there's a tremendous sense of togetherness. Like you yeah. were a tribe. You were, you kind of, in the, in the same sense that when you hear the stories of the Sahaba, like they were all in it together. Yeah. And they shared everything, and they mm-hmm. they were they formed this really cohesive unit that were doing everything together, from praying to fasting to working to sleeping to eating to. That's true. And I really get that sense that you were really a cohesive group, and that that's actually what drew a lot of people is like mm-hmm. they wanted to belong to something, and then when you get in the door, you see that you guys are really turning to God. It's not just that you you know, are co- you, that's was that's the glue that's holding you all together. Right. Yes, but that co- coherence came directly and specifically from the act of dhikr Allah. Mm-hmm. That was, there was no. That's what bound people together. We were together because of that. If you took that away, the, everything would have fallen apart. Mm-hmm. Fallen apart. So, and that, I think that's very important to 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 remember. I, that someone made a film recently, or part of a film that I saw about that that period. And I think they missed the point of what it was about because it was all about lifestyle. And it really had nothing to do with lifestyle. You know, I mean, we were talking about, you know, dressing, you know, the different things that we were doing. But it was always changing that people were doing different things all the time. And uh, so I, I think that's the, the most important the important thing to remember, that that's what kept us together. And it was, a, it was also a group that was... Um, generally part of something that was really authentic mm. and not made up uh, by someone who took bits and pieces from different right. so authentic, ancient lineage. Yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll have to do part two very soon because there's, I know you guys have your, your, your minds of stories so we have to mind a little bit deeper next time. So,